Good evening, I'm Hamish McDonald and I'm really excited to be here as your host for the 2020 GQ Big Ideas Summit presented by Optus. Thank you for joining us tonight for what's said to be a series of not only really interesting conversations, but important ones too. I know it's been an extraordinarily busy year for everyone and your days are probably full of video meetings, uh, but tonight it'll be screen time with a difference. We've got a great lineup of guests, all of them changing the world with big and bold ideas. Needless to say, this has been a huge year, from the bushfires to the pandemic, the US election and uprisings right around the world in protest against systemic racism. Over the last 12 months, life for all of us has changed. It's why this year GQ decided to launch this Big Ideas series, a trio of virtual seminars on the ideas that are shaping our world, not just today, but in the years ahead as well. The series so far has covered the future of sport, work and politics. And in case you missed any of them, you can watch all of them in full and for free at gq.com.au. Now, I'm really pleased to say that we've arrived at the final event of the series, the GQ Big Ideas Summit. And I'd like to acknowledge our partners. The GQ Big Ideas Summit would not be possible without any of them, thanks to our presenting partner, Optus, and supporting partner, Paco Rabanne Fragrances. They've been with us throughout this series, and we really appreciate all of the support. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting right now. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging and also to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of other communities who are joining us on this platform today. Now, we've got a huge lineup for you tonight. The NBA superstar Ben Simmons will be here. He's also founded the Do More Project, helping Australians become better informed and engaged in challenging racism. We're also drawing together three incredible Australian change makers who are taking big ideas and doing the hard yards to reshape our world. All of the people that you're going to meet tonight are thinking outside the box and spotting opportunities to bounce back from crisis. They really believe in big ideas and delivering on them. And that's what tonight is all about. By the end of this, we're also going to exclusively unveil GQ's November, December cover star. You can place your bets right now on who that might be. For the socials, if you're posting anything, the hashtag is GQ Big Ideas and you can tag GQ Australia as well. It's great to see you here for the GQ Big Ideas Summit. Let's get rolling. Ben Simmons is an NBA superstar. He's also a Melbourne native. He now plays for the Philadelphia 76ers and is one of basketball's brightest talents. He's already made two all-star appearances in his three years in the league. But as impressive as he has been on the court so far, Ben has shown that he's also a lot more than just an athlete. Earlier this year, as the COVID-19 pandemic started spreading like wildfire in America, Ben created the Philly Pledge to help those in Philadelphia hit hardest. Then, when the Black Lives Matter movement took hold, Ben again took things into his own hands, launching the Do More Project to help Australians become better informed and engaged in challenging racism. It's a fantastic initiative, and I'm really excited to learn a lot more about it. Here's a short preview of what it's all about. Australia, now is the time to do more. Racism has been around for far too long. We have to do more. Racism hurts. Racism creates distrust. Racism is ugly. Racism has caused a divide in our society. It's time for us to do more. Issues against racism have been swept under the rug for way too long. Discrimination, neglect and violence have been normalised in our communities. I know what it feels like to get discriminated against for being who you are and yeah, it hurts. Everyone is starting to see the cracks in structures built across the world. There is a tipping point right now in Australia and around the world. That's why right now is the time to do more. A time where injustices that were once done in the dark are now being exposed for all to see. Now is the time to do more. So that our future sons and daughters can live in a safe and equal environment. There's been a, a great catalyst um, for more action. It's time to fight for equality. There are many ways that people can do more. It's about listening and learning daily. Check yourself. We all have our own personal biases. I'm going to challenge myself and, and my own prejudices. Have these conversations with your family, with your friends. There's so much we can do because it's not enough to be not racist. We must be anti-racist and that's not a label. That's, that's a mindset that we have to put into practice every day. 
And every day is an opportunity to do more. Every day is an opportunity to put your hand up and be present and hold yourself accountable. I think all of us in our everyday life can keep this conversation alive. As our voice is so powerful and can influence change. We often talk about Australia being a multicultural country, which of course we are. But in the future, we won't just be one in name or in demographics, we will be one in heart. Those feelings of being included, of belonging, of passion for our country, those are the things that are going to make Australian society thrive. There can be no more excuses. We cannot stand by and allow for racism to exist in yet another generation. And for the younger generation, Race means so little, it's more about being accepted as part of a community. Project racism and build a more inclusive nation for future generations. It's the only way forward, that's why now is time to do more. Because equality for the whole of Australia is something we should all strive towards for a better future. Uh, ben, so great to meet you and I've got to say first off a huge congratulations on another great year. You were voted onto the All-NBA third team as well as the All-Defence first team. Uh, those accolades I know probably are not the reason you do this but it must, must mean a great deal in such a challenging year. Definitely. Um, it, it was definitely a tough year with, you know, considering everything going on but um, you know, I was blessed to do what I, do what I love, um, go and compete and uh, you know, the accolade, accolades come when you work hard and, and do what you're supposed to be doing so um i had a great year uh not the year we wanted but you know uh, definitely a lot of lessons we've learned um so i'm ready for next season what's it been like playing in the midst of everything that's going on in america right now from the pandemic to the election to the protests sort of trying to grapple with all of that at the same time as trying to sort of perform at an elite level it's it's tough. Um, just considering everything going on in the world, uh, you know, people forget. You know, athletes are humans too. You know, we got feelings. We we see everything going on. We're 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 hurt by certain things and, and movements and things like that. So um, it's tough, especially you know having to go into that bubble uh, while everything was going on and uh, just the state of you know the states, what was going on. Um, it's it's tough. You know, but we we still had to do what we had to do. Um, go out and compete. Um, and, and still use our voice. So uh, that, that's one thing I was definitely proud of. You know, a lot of players, um, you know, continuing to speak up through, you know, being in that bubble um, and, and not, you know, getting too caught up in, in just the game uh, itself. Yeah, I, I'm interested in that idea of using your voice because that's really been a standout feature of this season. Uh, was it an active conversation amongst you and y your teammates, players from other teams as well? Or was it just a sort of automatic thing for you to do instinctively? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're human. You know, guys are all talking about, um, you know, what's going on in the world. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's life. You know, guys go back to their families, they got kids, um, you know, that's, and that was a big part of it, going into that bubble. Um, it was tough, you know, with everything going on. Guys, you know, had to make that sacrifice. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something we needed to do. I I'm glad the NBA was able to uh, do it in a safe way. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it was, it was definitely worth it. Yeah. D did you at any point sort of consider the personal cost of, of, of taking the positions, of, of being an advocate, of being so clear and forthright on this stuff because you know we've seen it happen to, to players in, in various codes that there is pushback uh, that you can end up copying it you can sort of be brought into the into the sort of political game in a way that maybe you didn't intend uh, for, for taking a position on something that as you say is just part of being a human yeah I think um, just with everything going on um, you always want to use your voice and that's that's something I've done my whole life um, just the way I was raised, my dad, you know, always told me to speak up, um, but also educate myself on what I'm speaking on and, and, and handling it the right way. Um, but, you know, it's, if you look out throughout the league, um, guys were nonstop with it. And, and to this day, guys are still talking and speaking up, and that's what we need. Uh, and for myself, as being an Australian um, and having a black dad and being you know, an African-American Australian, uh, I have to use my voice 
because if I'm not doing it, um, it's it's not it's not always somebody who's going to step up. You know, there's guys like Patty Mills who who's another person who's doing a great job um, representing Australia and trying to educate people um, on everything going on. So I have to be somebody to use my voice and use it the right way. Yeah, you said your dad has always told you to 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 speak up. How big a feature were some of these issues for you as a kid growing up in Australia? It was huge. Um, you know, I think, I don't think everybody really realizes, you know, it happens every day. You know, racism is something that exists, whether we like it or not. Um, but it's something that's uncomfortable to talk about. Um, and that's, that's something I want to, you know, preach and put out there. You know, we have to have these talks. We have to discuss everything going on with racism. Um, in this world because at the end of the day it's one world. We all live in it um, and, and we just want equality. Mm. There's obviously still you know, a core of people in Australia that say, look, you know, we're not a racist country. You hear it from politicians that say that, you know, the issues that are in America are not the same as those here in Australia. Right. What's your perspective on that? That's wrong. Um, it happens every day, but it, it also, it's hard to really see it if you can't experience it you don't you, you've never been in that situation so you can't really tell somebody um you, it, australia is not a racist country i don't think not everybody's racist there's people out there who you know make mistakes but it's more about educating people and and helping them understand you know what's right from wrong uh, which is huge and that's why you know that's why we're doing the do more campaign um and just trying to educate people so but they're, at the end of the day, they're racist people too. So um, it's more so about educating people. Um, you know, I love Australia. I love going back home. And, and that's just something, you know, I, when I send people back to back back home, I want them to really, you know, be in Australia and feel comfortable and, you know, have a good experience there. Because I know it's a beautiful country. There's a lot of great people out there. Um, I mean, it's my home. So I want to make sure, you know, the right things are happening. Yeah, I do want to ask you more about do more, but you you do you, you do still consider Australia home? I mean, we can hear the we can hear the yeah. accent, Ben. Yeah, it's it's always going to be home. <laughs> um, you know, no matter what, it's it's where I'm from, um, and where I grew up. In terms of do more, what are you actually trying to achieve? Because you say it is about education, but you know, I note that you've got some incredible allies working with you on this project. They they represent a pretty broad cross section of Australian society. What does that tell us about what you're trying to achieve and, and how you're going to do it? For me, uh, I really believe it, it's, it's listening. That's the, that's the first step um, and acknowledging, you know, there is an issue um, with racism, even if it's not as clear as everybody thinks. Um, it happens every day. And, and the next, next step is educating yourself. So if you don't know, you're just going to keep doing the same thing. But once you're educated, you can really make the right decision or, you know, decide what you, how you feel, what you want to do um, in different situations. So as long as people are educated, and understand and willing to listen, um, it, it goes a long way. Yeah, you must have had a lot of conversations, though, in Australia about some of these issues. And I just wonder if you can give us an example of how you, you go about getting someone that isn't listening to actually listen to what you're, you're saying and what your experience is? It's, it's, it's the education part for me. Um, you know, people are always going to make their decisions based off how they feel, what do they want to do, right or wrong. But at the end of the day, it comes down to just that education part. Um, you know, there's, there's bad people in the world and there's good people. So not everybody's going to feel a certain way or want to be a certain way towards um, different situations in terms of racism. Um, but that's that's to give them that decision mm. and educate people and help them understand, you know, right and wrong. Um, if you decide to pick wrong, then that's just your decision. I, I suppose there's, there's probably going to be plenty of people watching right now that are that are thinking ahead to Christmas. Everyone's got that sort of crazy uncle uh, at the dining table that, that's got a sort of intransigent view of these sorts of issues. How do you reach them? I know you're saying it's about education, but... How do you right. actually, how do you convince them to, to open their mind to something as simple as a conversation about this? Um, I, I, when you say that, it's a good question because a lot of people, 
just haven't had experiences and that's that's not always their fault um but sometimes you just have to you know put yourself in somebody else's situation um you know how you want to be treated uh, and how you're treating other people um but at the end of the day there's always going to be people who are going to decide you know on the wrong side and, and step over there um but as, as long as you're able to educate as many people as you can um and help the the younger kids come through and really understand that's gonna it's gonna change a lot um and it's gonna change the country a lot i, I really believe that i'm interested that you you set this up in australia whilst you're living in america do you see there being you know major differences or or, or do you think actually the problems in australia around race mirror those in america i think it's it's a little different in terms of uh things you see, you know, obviously out here, there's a lot of gun, gun violence. Um, and it's kind of a different world in, in that space, um, which I'm blessed to be from Australia and, you know, we don't have to worry about, um, you know, getting shot or, or something like that. Um, but when you come out here, it's a whole different world. So it happens. Racism isn't always, you know, a, a police shooting, um, a black man. It, it, it's so broad and there's so many different things. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, my personal experience, the last one I had while I was back in Australia, going to the casino um, with four of us and four or five people and three of us getting randomly checked, um, which is which was wrong. Um, and then one person being allowed to go in and him being white. So there's it, certain things you see. Um, it's just it's it goes back to the education for me. We're talking to you in the midst of this sort of crazy uh, election cycle. And uh, I've read a lot of uh, writing from African-Americans in recent weeks that are sort of observing the fact that for all the division that clearly does exist in America, all the violence that there's been, particularly during this Trump presidency, uh, that there is something happening in America and that there are people voting for the first time in their hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, that there are people engaging with the political process. There are young people taking to the streets and actually trying to, to make change. Do you sort of see that as well, that, that for, all the, for all the difficulty, for all of the, the dangers there is an engagement, there is a, a hope that somehow is driving uh, the change? Definitely. I think, you know, it's, it's really hitting everybody. And this is a very important election. Um, and it's, it's encouraging people to vote and really realise what's going on in the world. Um, and when you have so many people around, around this country, uh, from athletes to actors and celebrities, um, encouraging the youth to vote, um, it's huge. And... You know, I think it's one thing to really educate yourself again. I, I hate to say it all the time, but education is the main thing, um, especially for me. You know, was, this is my first vote um, and it, it just went out. And so I'm educating myself on, you know, if I'm going to be living in this country and I'm going to have kids and a family. Uh, you know, you want good people uh, in the house. You want you want the country to be uh, taken care of. You want people to get along. You want, you know, peace and equality, uh, all these things. You say you, you want to have kids there. I'm sure there'll be plenty of people excited to hear that. <laughs> uh, is it an exciting time to be thinking about that or, or, or a scary time? Um, it's both, but it's, it's, it's time to vote. You know, it, it's time to, uh, for people to get out and vote and, and do those things that we need to do. Because um, at the end of the day, it's not about, you know, one person in charge. It, it's, it's about a collective, you know, everybody out here. Um, and everybody just wants to... Um, live peacefully and, and, and enjoy their time um, and feel safe and not and not feel excluded from certain things. Um, you know, I see it all the time. I got a lot of a lot of family in New York. Um, you know, my uncle talks about it all the time. You know, it's, it's different situations for um, a black man to get pulled over than from a white man. Um, so there's there's that feeling of it, it's scary. And, and I got you know nieces and nephews um, who are black, so. I think a lot of people get caught up in, in certain people thinking, you know, celebrities don't have to deal with certain things. But the other day, a lot of people um, have family members, have people who have been in different situations, difficult situations, who are in jail. Um, and it's just, it, it really comes back to the education. So once everyone's educated, uh, we can speak more on it. Um, so, yeah. 
Ben, I think we're clear that it's about education at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know whether you always feel safe, whether you always feel that you, your family and your friends are necessarily going to be safe in America today. I personally, um, I try to keep myself out of situations where I don't feel safe. Um, but I, yeah, I'm always concerned about you know my nieces, nephews, and my uncles, uh, my aunts, because uh, it can happen to anybody. And, and that's the one thing that people don't understand, um, that people are so outraged. It, it happens all the time. It's just the fact that now people have phones and cameras and we're able to see it, um, which is a great, a great tool for people to really you know, see and, and see what's going on going on in this world. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't always feel safe for, you know, my, my family. No. Uh, you have obviously put together the, the Philly pledge as well. You've got, uh, the refugee council of Australia, uh, on your site. I'm just interested to know whether you always had this idea of advocacy when you went into this, you know, there's a lot of people that have a big platform, right. have a big name, have huge success like you, but aren't using it in the same way. Did you always intend it yeah. to be like this or is it more about the circumstance you found yourself in? I'm blessed to, you know, have my voice. Everyone has a voice, but I'm blessed to be able to really put it out there and people for people to listen to me. Uh, the way I was raised, my mom said, you know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with, you know, your, who you are and you have to use it in the right way. So. For me, it's always about just being a good person and doing the right things. You, you can be a good person and do the right thing in, in tons of different ways, but it seems mm -hmm. to me that you've got some, some big ideas and that's what we're talking about at this summit. Is yeah. your big idea to sort of help people that are in more difficult circumstances than you? What, what's the sort of driving, so. motivating idea for you? It's just helping people. Um, you know, we're supposed to bring, bring each other up. You know, if somebody needs help, I'm definitely going to help them. And I'm going to use my, my voice and my power to do so, um, whichever way that is, whether it's, you know, trying to help kids get some, some coats for winter in Philly, um, helping people get food or whatever they need, um, and just doing the right thing. So to me, it's just helping out whenever or however you can. Um, you don't have to have millions of dollars to help people. Um, it, it could be just, you know, small acts of kindness. It does help having the millions, though, doesn't it? It does. It definitely <laughs> does. Um, and I'm blessed to be in that, that situation and be able to help people uh, that are less fortunate. The Philly Pledge, I was reading some of the, the details about what you've actually managed to do and, the, and I suppose the gap that you were trying to fill. It's extraordinary, I think, watching from Australia the situation with, with COVID-19 in America. Uh, and I suppose even more extraordinary that it's up to sort of individuals like you to make sure that people in, in your city are just getting the basics. Did it shock you Basically. the way this took hold and the way so many people seem to be left behind? It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, just the fact, you know, people are struggling to get, you know, the basic needs. Um, so I'm blessed to be in my situation. So when I, you know, when everything was going on, you know, you have to help. You know, it's something you just have to do. Um, and it's just doing the right thing and, and, and making sure you can help those in need. Because um, these are tough times. And those people who are fortunate, um, those people who are helping and, and, and doing those things are doing the right thing. And it really comes back to that, um, just helping others and trying to lift people up. Yeah, just take us back to the beginning of the Philly Pledge. Why did you decide this was needed? I, I mean, I, I play for Philly, so it's easier to, you know, say this. But for me, you know, this is another home. You know, leaving Australia, um, it, w it wasn't as easy to find a home because I was moving around a lot until I really got drafted to Philly. Um, so I feel like it's a responsibility of mine um, to help people in Philadelphia, um, you know, because they're supporting me every time I step on that floor. So, listen, it has been a difficult year. You talked about some of the challenges, sort of playing the game in amidst all of this. Uh, I think everybody uh, watching you tonight will have had their own experience of, of a tough year. Mm -hmm. Do you end 2020 with a bit of optimism, though? You have to. Um, you have to. That's one thing about me. You know, I'm always going to be um, looking ahead and hoping for the best. You know, I, I think um, I don't know how, how much worse it can get. Uh, than this year, but um, you know I think just everything going on—it's it's a special time. Um, 
for everyone to really to come together and uh, just, just build each other up. I suppose America has never felt further away from us here in Australia, given the, the border closures. Are you, are you missing uh, Australia at all? I mean, you've been over there for yeah. such a long time. But I suppose, you know, we've all become accustomed to, to being able to move between Australia and America uh, so easily if we want to or need to. Uh, I know a lot of your fans here would, lo would love to see you in person. Definitely. I, w I wish I could come back. Um you know, just with a ticket and, you know, straight into the city. But uh, it, it's, it's a very difficult time. Um, but I can't wait to get home. You know, I, I miss it a lot. Uh, ben, it's been tremendous talking to you uh, for this. We're, we're so grateful to you and so impressed by the big ideas that you're delivering on. Uh, good luck for the rest of 2020. Have a great Christmas and uh, say, stay safe during these uh, pretty, pretty crazy times. Crazy times. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, that fantastic chat with Ben Simmons might be hard to top, but I've got a very good feeling about the group of incredible Australians that you're about to meet. Joining me here in the studio is Jess Wegner, who's the co-chair director of the Fire Sticks Alliance. Also with me in the studio is Sam Elsom, a former fashion designer turned seaweed farmer. Still got the style, though. Uh, joining us on the line from Canberra, though, is Sophia Hamlin-Wong, uh, who turns carbon into bricks, the technology that could hold the key to a much brighter and cleaner future for all of us. Uh, I'm so thrilled that you can all be here for this conversation tonight. It's great to see you all. Uh, and what would it be in 2020 without a dodgy video connection to Sophia in Canberra? Uh, Sophia, how are you? Good to see you uh, from the nation's capital. Thank you. Thank you for having me, for coming all the way from Canberra. <laughs> um, hey, Sam, I want to start with you. All of you, I think, are sort of spotting opportunity in crisis. You've identified ways of kind of working through really difficult sets of circumstances. Tell me the sort of turning point for you uh, that, that switched your course in life from being a fashion designer to becoming a seaweed farmer. It was, sort of, it was a video conference call a bit like this, I think. It, it was, yeah, Hamish, with, uh, with the Climate Council, with Tim Flannery leading, um, you know, really alarming, actually, um, uh, kind of outline of, of uh, the consequences of global warming and, and mm. the, the 10 years really that we had left um, to kind of make a difference. Um, I'm a father of two young kids and, and what we do today will largely impact the livelihood that they have. So, so you just joined this call as someone in the fashion industry? No, I think, you know, even in the fashion industry, I always had environmental leanings. You know, what we yeah. were trying to do was impact supply chain and, uh, uh, and you know, environmentally impact the supply chain, re reduce uh, the amount of chemicals used through um, the production of cotton and, and, and working on circular and innovative textiles. So it was always sort of there. Um, but, you know, just, I think Tim was made it very clear that we have a finite amount of time to do something about it. But what was, I thought, uh, the most surprising part of his, his, his um, presentation was around the solutions and the solutions do exist, you yeah. know. And and seaweed, it seemed to me, seemed relatively uncomplicated. You know, uh, Tim explained seaweed to be a zero input crop, you know, unreliant on fresh and finite water supplies, um, as well as it doesn't require fertilise fertilising yeah. or and is unimpacted by dr droughts or, or fires. So it seemed, you know, and I was naive at the time. I've learnt since, but the, a relatively simple solution to climate change. You're making it sound sexy, but it is seaweed. And it involves convincing a lot of people on something that they may not be predisposed to. I mean, did you did you immediately sort of spot the opportunity there? Uh, it took a fair bit of research, obviously, you know, to, to completely, you know, take that type of sea change, if you like. Yeah. Um, but but ultimately, you know, seaweed photosynthesizes. It draws down tremendous amounts of carbon. They grow thirty times faster than trees, and um, and. They're, like I said, a zero input crop. So they just use sea water, sunlight effectively to grow. And yeah. so it was about finding the right species of seaweed to grow that we could have the largest impact in the shortest period of time. Um, and then, you know, so that required a fair bit of research. So one, one thing that I learned along the way was that seaweed industry in Australia is, is, is almost non-existent. It's an $11 billion industry globally, but is held where our country is held back largely because about nine of the 12 um, major species that are farmed around the world are non-endemic to our waters. Mm. So it can't be grown. 
Um, and so it was when the CSIRO discovered asparagopsis, that, which is a, a native seaweed that when fed in small doses to livestock eliminates methane, um, that became my sole focus. Okay. I, I want to get to the sort of turning point for you in, in your yeah. life and career, but, but Jess, you're also someone that spots opportunity in a crisis. Just explain what fire sticks is, what does it do, um, how is it sort of taking hold of, of, of this year and all the really dramatic and devastating things that have happened? So I, I guess Hamish, uh, the, um, the Fire Sticks Alliance is an Indigenous led organisation that's a national approach to the reinvigoration of cultural fire practices across Australia as a whole and it's it's about bringing together that knowledge and providing opportunities for that knowledge to start um, building back its place within the Australian landscape as There's, a whole. There seems to have been a bit of a turning point in recent yeah. years where suddenly <laughs> we're all talking about Indigenous fire practices uh, and particularly I think you know I spent a lot of this summer on the south coast covering the bushfires. Suddenly we were talking about it in a way that we we hadn't been previously. Mm. What was that like for you? Were you like oh finally people Absolutely. are sort of listening? <laughs> it was like a finally moment for for a lot of people within the Fire Sticks Alliance Network and um, Aboriginal people as a whole. It's a practice that's been done for thousands and thousands of years by our ancestors that we've been wanting to revive this knowledge for so long that it's now being heard, which is a, it's a beautiful thing to, to know that people are looking to cultural practices that has sustained a, a way of life in yeah. Australia for so long. I do want to get into the mechanics yeah. of it, how it works, yeah. what you're teaching, how you're teaching, mm. uh, but I just want to sort of understand how much of a, a change there has been this year. I mean, yeah. you know, from the Prime Minister down, you've got leaders saying we actually want to take on this knowledge, we want to listen and learn in a way that I think, you know, is kind of unfamiliar in terms of the way particularly white Australian leadership approaches Indigenous culture and, and heritage. Just from your point of view, how significant a step change is, has that been? It's a huge change. Uh, we're, we're usually in the, the um, uh, I think Victor Stephenson describes it as we're, we're in the passenger seat. Yeah. Um, Victor Stephenson is, is an Indigenous fire yeah. practitioner. He's written an amazing book yeah. all about these practices and he goes you know, from north to south in this country sharing the knowledge. Yeah. He sure does. Um, and he describes it as, uh, you know, for the last 200 or so years, we've been in the passenger seat or in the back seat. And uh, we're now given, I guess, an opportunity to drive that um, that car um, mm. all the way through well, to... Well, he talks about a bus. Well, uh, it's yeah, a bigger yeah, it's vehicle. It's a bigger, <laughs> bi bigger vehicle. We definitely need one for Australia to come along for the ride. Um, and let us let us show how it is to, to socially connect, to environmentally connect and to... Um, in, you know, as a whole, um, to be able to bring back a practice that that's definitely needed. It's not um, something that should be uh, forgotten about, um, and it needs to re-involve into today's society. I think it's a, it's very much um, something that people are looking towards changing their mindsets about yeah. uh, the way that we're currently applying the fire authorities are applying fire. Um, yeah, and changing it to a way that's uh, it's more um, detailed in relation to the, the vegetation types that we're, we're associating with fire. Uh, now, Jess, Sam, I'm disappointed neither of you brought props, no fire, no fire sticks, no, no seaweed. Uh, Sophia, you have, though, brought some props to, to help us understand what it is that you do. Yeah, so uh, I've brought in this little carbon brick that my company, Mineral Carbonation, has been uh, creating. So uh, what we're actually doing is just linking in with what Sam and Jess are talking about, natural, traditional ways that uh, in our Indigenous cultures have um, tended to the land and the way that the earth stores CO2 in vegetation, in trees and in seaweed. That's all extremely important. And my company uh, just accelerates the way that the earth naturally stores CO2. So in the earth's crust, uh, the um, CO2 is naturally stored over millions of years. And we've just taken that process from a matter of millions of years into hours in, um, in our facility in Newcastle. So we process minerals and react it with CO2 and that produces cements and plasterboards like, uh, like this one, okay. which actually 
represents negative emissions technology. And so are you doing this at scale yet? Because that's the key question, isn't it, with a lot of this technology? We've got governments, uh, businesses all over the world kind of banking on this being able to be done at scale. Yeah, so it takes 20 years for technologies to develop from laboratory into market. So it doesn't happen overnight. You need to um, grow stepwise. You can't take too many uh, risks, but we're trying to accelerate as quickly as possible. And we're already doing this. We've completed a pilot phase and we're just at the moment about to raise capital to uh, expand into a demonstration scale in Australia. So, Jess, this is all happening in Newcastle. I mean, it must be dazzling, given where you're from, That's right. uh, to just see this. Oh, it's incredible. I can't wait to catch up with you and uh, <laughs> you know, really find out more about what you're doing because it, it is, like you're saying, it, it, it is a traditional um, way of using the landscape to support a more environmentally friendly way forward. And um, I definitely acknowledge and, and respect that we've mm. got to, you know, um, amazing people here also that have said it, there's 10 years to go until um, things start going a bit crazy so I'd love it, to get behind it. It's interesting though everything that you do is sort of about tradition, about mm. culture, uh, about things that I suppose for you probably seem very simple but you see the parallels with the, the technology True. that Sophia is talking about. Yeah it's incredible that we can use nature in a way that supports an environmentally friendly way forward um, and it's a, it's a very simple practical um, and knowledgeable way to to really um, and I think you know it's something that community and society wants to see come forward I, I definitely um, have seen uh, groups of community that think that this is uh, an incredible way yeah. forward. Sam, you said the thing I that appeal, appealed to you with the seaweed is the simplicity of it, that the solution was kind of there. Uh, what's the relationship between that solution and, and Sophia's? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I also mentioned that I was a little naive, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but you know that it is that it is important that you know what Sophia is doing is that that solutions are there and that but they just require individuals with some nous to to take them on and, and really drive um, you know industrial scale solutions to to what is you know going to have a catastrophic impact on our way of life if we don't do anything at all. So it's it's uh, a challenge, but a worthwhile challenge for sure. You know something I'm I'm really pleased about the progress that we've made over a short period of time. But it's, you know, it is a journey, as Sophia said. How important is a bit of naivety when you're going into to, to sort of delivering on a big idea? I think it's probably extremely important, Hamish, yeah. I think, you know, uh, you can get overwhelmed with the details for sure. Um, and, you know, that can create anxiety and that can, you know, stop you from taking the action that's yeah. necessary. So, yeah, maybe it's necessary. Is it, Sophia, do you think having a degree of naivety or optimism, whatever we want to call it, is that sort of central? Because, as you say, it's a you know, 20-year lead time to get something to, to market. Hard-headed optimism is unbelievably important. And if you want to call it naivety, that's fine. But what we're talking about here is uh, changing the way that we consider waste, uh, really, in uh, my case anyway, we're looking at um, treating a toxic gas that is um, emitted freely from a lot of our industrial um, settings uh, and treating that as a resource. So we're saying carbon dioxide is a resource that can be turned into lots of different things. Why don't we innovate and why don't we create value out of this waste in a circular economy mindset? And um, I think optimism is super important because right now there are a lot of companies and countries in the world that are determined to continue with business as usual because it's profitable for them to do so. But it's actually a really short term um, view of what's happening because we all know we experienced the bushfires in Australia this year. It was horrific. More weather events like that are going to be um, the norm in the future if we continue to emit in the way that we are. So when you say At countries, same, are you talking about Australia? Uh, I think Australia this year has really uh, turned up in a way that uh, 
has really ramped up our um, applications and considerations for which technologies are going to help us to get to net zero. Um, I would I would say that other countries in the world um, that uh, there are other countries in the world that haven't um, that have waxed and waned a little bit more than Australia. I think we're really starting to ramp up now our, our technological approaches with our technology investment roadmap coming out of um, the government just a couple of months ago. So it, it, it's setting forward at least a, a plan for how we're going to get to um, net zero. I, I do want to ask you about that, but do you guys see that same thing happening this year? Do you think Australia has turned a corner? Because there's a lot of people in our community, I think, that would be sceptical of, of that sort of claim. Yeah. yeah, I am a little sceptical. I think we, you know, we're, we're short on commitment. You know, I think we're, we're definitely, as Sophia said, we're, we're almost there and there, is, there has been a shift, I think. But, but there's so what's no, the shift been? Well, I think an attitude shift. I think there's been a huge swell of, of voices from, you know, in terms of public opinion around climate change. And I think we're in this position where we've had COVID and now we're looking at how do we you know, invest our way out of this and, and what industries do we need to invest in? This is the government. Mm. And uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunities in renewable energy and, uh, you know, environmentally positive industries. So how do you... I mean, you're all people that are actually uh, not just creating the big idea, you're advocating for it and you seem to be delivering on it, all of your very sort of differing stages. But I just wonder if we sort of look at that from a, from a broader Australian community uh, frame... How do you take that groundswell of voices, the sort of mood change perhaps is a better way of describing it, and translate that into, into tangible difference to, to sort of policy outcomes, to, to you know, committing to the emissions reductions that we sort of talk about broadly? Do you see the path? I think, you know... Who was it? I, I think of back to the Equinor... Um, you know, fight for the bite campaign and, and the, all of those voices that got together that really changed uh, what seemed to be an inevitable outcome. Which We're was talking about drilling in the Great Australian Drilling bite. in the Great Australian yeah. Bight. And that they've since changed their plans and they've gone back to Norway. And that was be largely because of Australian voices standing up for what they believe because in. Because people sort of paddling out on surfboards? Yeah, and that... I don't think a, a, you know, a Prime Minister or, or a politician wanted to be behind Equinor in that fight. And so I think we, we underestimate the power of, of, of our communities and, and the opinions that we have. So tell me a bit more about what Firesticks is doing in terms of actually teaching this knowledge. What, what, what are you going in and talking to rural fire service operators about, to, to sort of local councils, to state governments? What, what are you actually teaching them? Yeah, uh, there's a number of ways that we do that. So there's a National Indigenous Fire Workshop that we hold annually. Um, unfortunately, this year it couldn't be held because of COVID. Yep. Um, let's but... not mention it. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, let's spread that out. <laughs> um, but it's been running for, for a number of years. And so the National Indigenous Fire Workshop was, um, was something that Drs Tommy and George Musgrave, who are our elders in, in knowledge that was shared for this purpose to, to enlighten and to share with the wider society of Australia and internationally about the need to apply a cool fire. Um, so that these national workshops are open to people uh, from government agencies, community, Aboriginal people. And are you going to them all... or are you taking them out to country? We, we take the workshop around Australia. Yeah. Uh, so for the first couple of years, it was held in Cape York. Uh, in 2018, it was held in the Bundanon Trust mm -hmm. uh, down in the south coast. And then 2019, down on uh, the Barma National Park. I, I, which... I suspect most people would be familiar with hazard reduction burning. How does, yeah. how does Indigenous fire practice differ? It's, it's very different. Um, and that's the first thing that people liken it to, right, is a hazard reduction burn, um, yet we're doing it. Uh, but it's actually not like that. It's a, it's a very cool fire that's applied um, with community understanding of all the different elements that are involved in uh, knowing the right time to apply fire in a particular vegetation type, which is quite important. Um, what do you Australia's... mean by cool fire, though? Yes. So as, uh, Fire intensity is quite important uh, for understanding uh, the, the way that fire reacts and can uh, 
be quite impactful to the native vegetation type and the, um, also the plants and the, the fauna that live in there. So we want to apply a cool fire, mm. which is slow, where it's low intensity, it's low to the ground. Um, it just trickles across and eats away at the cured parts of the grasses and leaves. Um, and it also allows space for the, the little bugs, uh, the spiders, uh, the birds, the, the lizards, everything starts to, to you know, be able to get away from these fires, which isn't the case when there's a wildfire or in hazard reduction. And you don't add fuel either, is no, that right? That's right. Uh, no drip torches, no, um, no pushing the fire along. Uh, it's allowed to just trickle along um, nicely, go where it needs to be, so it ends up being a little bit patchy in places, which is, a, is also a protection zone for the, the little lizards and, and snakes and everything else you find in the bush. So a question about scale for you as well, because I think many Australians sort of saw the summer that we've had, many are convinced that actually you need to do really big burns in the available season. Yeah. You've got to get rid of as much sort of dry bushland as possible to sort of prevent the widespread devastation that we've seen. Is that your view? Do you, do you take a different approach to it? Because it's, it's hard to imagine mm. these practices being applied at such scale, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, I think we need... Uh, so a lot of the investment that we've got out there is to get the knowledge out there. Um, so we're, we're out there training our Aboriginal um, leaders in their, their communities to be able to understand the vegetation types. Um, they're bringing out their knowledge as well and providing respectful engagement between the authorities for fire and the, the authorities for country, um, being the traditional owners. And so we're not talking about one pathway. replacing the other, this is sort of more partnership. Partnerships, absolutely, 100%. The, the experiences that we've all had um, and, and communities is that if people are open to, to listening, um, particularly the RFS and Fire and Rescue and other fire authorities are, are wanting to learn more about cultural burning so they can start to be involved in, in putting a better practice mm. forward. Um, so I guess we're impacting on a community level to raise their voices yeah. um, so that they're heard locally because it's reliant on um, the local community to start to engage in that cultural practice of applying of cultural fire. So you're putting them on the bus? Then they're on the bus, they're in the driver's seat yep. um, with the Fire Sticks Alliance there holding them um, there and helping them to be the voice for their, their community mm -hmm. and everybody else's. What's the long-term ambition yeah. with this? I mean do you have a vision of how we would prepare for yeah. fire seasons differently in the long term? Uh, I, I I do say this because my son, um, he comes along to, to cultural burning practices and there's been a few times we've had workshops with schools and it is something that, you know, in the future, I've, I hope that there's no fear around cultural fire um, and that we can provide a space for understanding of the right type of fire mm -hmm. um, and how to apply that. And it's a, it's a transferable knowledge practice, um, which is culturally appropriate to, to make sure that our next generations do it better. Uh, and would that, in your view, change the way Australia as a, as a country actually prepares yeah. for bushfire seasons? I think it will. Um, the more that people understand the seasonality and the localisation of the, the right type of fire to apply, it will uh, change the, the way in which our communities interact with nature, um, know their responsibility for the landscape in which they live. Um, it'll create a sense of belonging um, that I think is needed with the whole of Australia because yeah. um, um, there's this integral connection that occurs when you're around cultural fire. Did you know much about this stuff, Sam, before this year? I've always been a big fan, actually. Really? Um, yeah, I, I actually had, during the um, bushfire season, a little auction, and we raised money for Fire, fire Sticks Alliance, um, but a little yeah. art auction in our community. But I was really interested to understand, Jess, how, um, how government and councils are, are integrating this mm. knowledge into sort of their own land management and fire management um, backburning. Is, is it happening right now? It, it's in the process of happening and in many communities uh, locally they, uh, there's a lot of communities that are actually you know, ahead of others so it's hard to kind of scope out um, you know, and really say uh, from experience but I, I do know that there's local councils um, where I, I live as well, there's, the councils are very interested in understanding the seasonality um, of 
a landscape so they can start to understand yeah this is the time that these are f things are flowering we can collect um, bush foods that we can eat and and provide that um, experience as well as this is the right time to apply cultural fire in our area what should we be doing and who should we mm -hmm. be engaging mm -hmm. so there's um, the cultural burn plans that are starting to be developed there's um, writing into policies uh, there's a, a lot of people that are and researchers that are getting involved with the with the fire sticks alliance to be able to start to you know get this embedded in something mm -hmm. that hasn't had this mentioned at all previously so yeah. there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. So and Sam I know you've been cut off from your seaweed yeah. for a lot of this year because of Covid you haven't been able to That's be true. in Tasmania yeah. a lot of the time. Uh, how much do you dream about seaweed? Um, yeah I do actually it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, been pulled up a few times for talking seaweed in my sleep actually. But seriously? Like, yeah no seriously. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, lots of Zoom calls and, uh, and I'm thankful to be supported by an incredible scientific team. You know, we've got research commissioned at, at UTAS, um, Tasmania obviously, and then um, also University of Waikato in New Zealand yeah. and the James Cook University. So some great, you know, brains behind our methods for cultivation. And so we're, we're actually cultivating the seaweed in land, land and at sea. And so there's been a, a load of developments that have happened down on farm that I haven't been able to get down there to see. B bursting for, for borders to be open, I'm yeah. sure. But uh, you sort of talked about the, the stats on this, and they are pretty remarkable given the size of Australia's uh, agricultural sector. Um, you know, there's been you know great strides made in certain parts of our energy output at getting the emissions down, but agriculture is a real challenge. What is the potential impact for seaweed? It's enormous. So, I mean, on one side of the the um, the scale, there's the, the obviously the carbon sequestration potential. So, carbon is stored by all plants, really, but seaweeds in particular, the whole organism, um, so it synthesizes all the time. They grow up to 30 times faster than trees. Yeah. But which is amazing in, in and of itself. And also, it doesn't the farming of seaweed doesn't impact our our habitable land and farmland and things. So. There's that kind of positive environmental impact. Also provides um, habitat for fish and marine life. Yeah. Um, with the feeding of our asparagopsis to livestock um, and, and the abatement of methane as a result has a huge potential. Um, methane emissions from livestock are the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions at 15% after the generation of electricity. So it's an enormous. And you only need to feed a bit of the seaweed into their diet. Yeah, less than a fistful a day. So it's a 0.2% of an animal's diet is, is the seaweed. Do they like it? They do, apparently. <laughs> We've got a really interesting trial happening. The, at the cows moment. are fans of sushi. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's funny because there's a, there is a trial that we've got running at the moment with a, with a, um, a merino wool farm, actually, where the, um, we, we were out there to witness them getting fed their daily ration. And the, the group being fed the asparagopsis raced to the trough to get their feed. So, okay. so we, I don't know if it was just on that particular day, but it was a, a definitely, um, it seems as though they like it. So it's a big transition for you to go from the fashion industry to something like this. Uh, and I imagine it's a bit of a leap of faith, right? Totally. Yeah. So, so are there days where you're like, I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing? No, there haven't been those days. No, right. I've had, you know, as we talked about, you know, that, that kind of blind confidence and, and, and optimism, I think, is, is that's necessary, you know. And, and you know, I'm, I, as I said, I'm really thankful for the team that I have behind me yeah. that's driving a lot of the results that we're getting and the progress, the very fast progress that we've made over a short period of time. Um, and so, you know, having that support network around me has been important. Is there much scepticism? Do you meet much scepticism? I mean, I imagine that the, sort of the, the Tassie farmers that you're dealing with, they see this bloke flying down from Sydney with his man bun and his pocket square <laughs> telling them about this bright future with seaweed. There must be a bit of, what, come on, what are you, what, what are you Maybe, doing? Maybe, you know, but I think, yeah, because the CSIRO in Australia, you know, it's our leading research institution, yeah. has, has discovered this seaweed in the first place, and I think they're highly respected. Um, so that's one thing. But the other, the other is that I was surprised to find that, uh, that farmers are actually already trying to explore solutions um, and there are a limited number of solutions but also Meat and Livestock Australia and Dairy Australia both have invested millions into solutions. They've set their own carbon neutral 2030 targets but uh, with no 
finite roadmap to get there. So the, at the moment, the seaweed seems to be the most promising solution. So livestock and, and dairy farmers are excited, which yeah. I'm, I'm surprised as you would be to, to hear. Sophia, scepticism, no doubt, is something that you <laughs> run into. You were sort of talking about the, the government's technology roadmap. There's been a huge political fight about that. A lot of people saying, look, the government is throwing tonnes of uh, taxpayers' money, potentially, at technology that, that hasn't yet been proved to work. Where do you sit on that? Because, I mean, obviously you stand to benefit a lot from this. Uh, and, and it must also be a fair amount of pressure to deliver on on what, what would be an amazing promise if fulfilled? I think it's it's interesting because the the government has said that they want to be technology neutral and not pick winners. But at the same time, they kind of have come out and said that there are five technologies that are going to help us, um, that, that are priorities to get us mm. to a low emissions future. Um, the technology that I work on is called carbon capture and utilisation or carbon capture and use. And we didn't quite make it onto that priority, but we are an emerging technology, which means that uh, we will uh, probably benefit from some kind of policy certainty, which is, I guess, what it is all about. We want to make sure that there is a, a level enough playing field for new technologies to emerge so that you're not um, picking winners and then stopping any other new technologies from coming through. At the end of the day, the way that we're going to get there to a, a low emissions future or net zero is through a portfolio of solutions that are applied in many different areas. Um, I, I think that the um, technologies like mine have um, really struggled to um, get airtime because the government has kind of picked uh, a few other um, technologies as winners, but that's not how it's going to be moving forward. We're going to ensure that there is a collective voice for other technologies that um, have lots of potential. I think seaweed is so wonderful. I'm just really, I'm blown away by this uh, conversation. I wish it could go for double as long because, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sam, I was just thinking when you were saying you got through part of this year through Zoom calls, I was just thinking of you with asparagopsis <laughs> on <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> That's um, what happens in know, his dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sophia, what we need to do is... It, it strikes sorry. me that given all of you are sort of pursuing these big ideas, you must spend an awful lot of time trying to convince people, trying to explain things that are incredibly complex mm. in a digestible way and sort of take people along with you. Um, you know, we began this by talking to, to Ben Simmons about his experience in the United States and trying to, to raise awareness about racism in Australia and use his platform for advocacy and sort of having conversations with family and friends that don't necessarily see the world that, that you do. I know you grew up in far north Queensland. You've got a lot of family and friends that are they're in the mining sector. Really different views on a lot of this stuff. If you're trying to deliver on a big idea... What do, you, what do you have to do to open the conversation? How do you change the, the hearts and minds, or win the hearts and minds? So it's all about respect for people who have differing opinions to you and understanding that we're all, um, we're all doing our best and we're all, um, our opinions and the attitudes to different things are just based upon the the media we consume and the values of the um, houses that we've grown up in. And I, I, I totally understand that there are um, a variety of views when it comes to climate change and clean tech. But um, for me and my technology, sometimes we don't even use the words climate change or sustainability when we we talk in forums. You know, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in January and um, standing up in front of, you know, the, the top, the leaders of um, the biggest countries in the world and the top CEOs. And um, I stood there and I said, hey, climate change is an opportunity. There are so many businesses that can emerge from this. There's money to be made. There's competitive advantages uh, that our countries can uh, can create in order to um, yeah to export 
um, green materials in order to uh, create value out of this opportunity. And this brick is something that is a tangible um, thing that you can hold and say, hey, I guess we could be creating uh creating opportunities in creating um, sustainable minerals. We could de be decarbonizing the cement industry, the steel industry. There are, sorry, that, that is a, a point I haven't made yet, is that um, we have amazing renewables in Australia and lots of really good opportunities to get to low emissions um, energy. But there are other industries like the steel and cement industry that don't have clear decarbonisation pathways. Mm. How are we going to be making steel in the future? We still need to be using metallurgical coal to do that. So we need clear ways to decarbonise those industries. Mm. So what my company is doing is taking those emissions pretty much just the raw flue gas from the stack pipe and um, rendering it inert and turning it into something that can be stored for 10,000 years or more. So you need to take the brick to the Christmas table <laughs> to have the conversation with the drunk uncle. I asked Ben Simmons about the conversations that you have with the, with the crazy uncle in your family that doesn't see what you see, that doesn't believe these conversations are needed. Mm -hmm. Do you have a tactic? Do you have a do you have an approach? How do you how do you cut through uh, in those conversations in those moments? Yeah, I think um, some of those moments have actually been on the ground um, where you're about to apply fire. So there's a real need to develop trust in those instances where you've got someone that's very skeptical on ground and um, you know, you're there to change their mindset. Um, it's so a beautiful how do you do process. It? How do you do it with them? Yeah, you you um, in, in, you hold a, a, a circle and you talk about the the value of why you're about to apply fire this way. And, and in most cases, those people haven't actually been on a fire ground before. Yeah. So that first moment where you've got your match or your your um your flame and you're about to put it on the grass, um, this person's you know fear levels are quite high. Um, and then they, they see it and it's just, ah, oh. you know, this, um, this peaceful uh, fire is in front of them and it's just slowly eating away at the, the dead parts of the grasses and they can see the green still there and then they get it. So it's visual. They're gently holding their feet to the fire. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and you can, uh, you know, we show them that you can put your, your hand right next to it and where it's been before, you can actually touch the ground. There's no heat that's retained yeah. uh, in a cultural fire um, when it's done appropriately. So it's, it's quite a beautiful process for someone to physically be embedded in actually feeling, seeing, being um, and connecting to the the process of applying cultural fire. It's, yeah, it's pretty special. So how about you? How do you, how do you cut through in those moments, in those conversations? Everyone's getting ready for Christmas. They know <laughs> these conversations are coming up with someone in the family. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate. I haven't had to, I haven't had too much pushback with regards to the seaweed. You know, we're, we're an ag agricultural country largely and, uh, you know, seaweed is farming just like any other. And, you know, you can relate to farmers through the way we talk about, you know, watering crops and, you know, there's a far finite amount of irrigation required where you've got this ocean and it all sort of makes sense in a weird way. Feeding um, seaweed to livestock is, is slightly different. You know, they're obviously concerned about, you know, the, if, if it's the merino wool farmer, he jokes that the fleece is going to turn green or <laughs> <laughs> and other things. But, but, you know, largely everybody's been quite supportive. Um, but, you know, in Jess's case, I think that that's just such a powerful uh, message to, to try to that education piece because we bring with us, when we talk about fire, we bring with us a whole history of huge, large, you know, everything from Ash Wednesday yeah. to the fires that we had yeah. before. So there is fear, deep fear. Deep. That, that, is, that comes with um, our relationship to fire. And so changing that, I think, is a long journey. And it also, you know, the smoke from fire is largely contributes to climate change and all of that. So the, we're trying to change climate change. We're also trying to manage, manage things effectively moving forward. So it's, it's, it's a heavy burden to bear, you know, but, but an important one. 
Well, guys, we are almost at the end of the evening, but we do have some incredibly exciting news. GQ Australia uh, is really proud to announce that it will be supporting Fire Sticks uh, with a $50,000 donation on behalf of News Corp Australia, which has contributed over $3 million to improve the lives and livelihoods of those most affected by the recent devastating bushfire season. Uh, so huge thanks, obviously, to GQ and to News Corp Australia for that donation. I'm sure that's going to make a, a huge difference to you guys. I certainly will. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you to all of our wonderful guests this evening. Ben Simmons, obviously, talking to us from America. Uh, Sam Elsom and Jessica here in the studio with me. And also Sophia Hamlin Wong. It's been great talking to you guys. Really a tremendous uh, evening of uh, insights, innovations uh, and, of course, big ideas. That does bring us to the end of the GQ Big Ideas Summit, though. Uh, thanks again to our wonderful sponsors, presenting partner Optus and supporting partner Paco Rabanne Fragrances. And thank you to everyone who took part in this evening's event. You're all doing such amazing work and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys get up to uh, over the years ahead. Uh, and finally, thanks to you for sharing this evening with us. I'm going to leave you with one final treat. Uh, please enjoy your exclusive sneak peek at GQ's November-December cover star uh, and be sure to pick up a copy when the issue goes on sale this Monday, the 9th of November. Wishing everyone a very happy, healthy end of the year and here's to a much better 2021. Thank you. Good night. Hi, I'm Daniel Ricardo, and welcome to my GQ Australia cover shoot.